Um, so my name is my name is David, and um, I'm an artist based in Dundee, as uh, Kirsty said. Um, both Pamela and I work from home, so we are up in Kirkton at the north of the city. Um, we have a, a three-bed house um, up here with uh, our three dogs. They don't get a bedroom each. We have one bedroom, and then we have a studio each. So Pamela's studio is upstairs, and we're actually currently in uh, in, in my studio. We used to share, but um, Pamela has a lot of stock. <laughs> it just got too cramped for her packaging up her Etsy orders and whatnot. So I volunteered to take the, the, the dingy room and uh, she has a nice bright one upstairs. But um, so I'm a freelance artist and I have been for, uh, I've been full time for 10 years. I started off as a photographer and I still do a lot of photography and a lot of video work. It's um, kind of bread and butter, I suppose, but um, Initially, we were based in Edinburgh, um, and it's quite, um, well, not easy, but it's easier to maintain a, a full-time photography practice there. In Dundee, you need to kind of um, generalise a little bit more, so arts education kind of came into my, uh, my remit there. Um, and sort of working with various different organisations as a facilitator um, or a, an artist tutor, so the McManus, the DCA, um, Tayside Healthcare Arts Trust, amongst others. Um, my artistic practice, we've got the photography and the video, um, but I also do painting, printmaking, sound and music. And so the studio that we're in just now, you can see the drawing cam on the, the gallery view. So that's my painting desk actually. And then behind us we have the, the music section. So guitars, recording equipment and whatnot. And the dogs are sitting on the reading chair. Which the is thinking next, chair. The thinking chair. <laughs> yeah. And this desk here is for photography and video. So it was quite important to me to bring all four aspects of my practice together. So research and then the three sort of main areas. So that's been quite interesting. And I'll maybe touch on that again when I get down to talking about my fun -a day project for this year. But um, I'll show you some of my work. Um, let me just share this screen here. Okay. okay. Can everyone see that okay? Yep, all good. Perfect. So shamefully, I have not updated my websites in over three years. Um, so this is a little outdated, um, but I do have some newer video work that I'm gonna I'm gonna show you. But my practice is um, event documentation, um, generally working with uh, creative organisations. That's what I prefer to do. In Edinburgh, there was a lot more corporate stuff, which isn't as interesting. You can see. Um, Edgehill University, for example, was a, a book festival thing. Um, the sort of corporate doodads at the, um, the fringe um, place up um, at the top of the Royal Mail in Edinburgh. But the, um, the concert stuff, this was at the Gardine Theatre, uh, or working with charities. Uh, Crisis is a charity I worked with quite a lot when I was in Edinburgh. Uh, they work with uh, single homeless uh, people. So working um, in a kind of community context where you're dealing with people who perhaps aren't used to being photographed. So there's a, um, there's a conversation and um, there's, um, there's a lot of talking. Uh, in fact, more talking and being aware of your surroundings than uh, actually taking photographs, which is why I kind of found education to be quite a nice fit. Um, so just going through and um, if you go to davidpscott.com uh, you can uh, you can look at these in a little bit more detail but conference and events and um, you know this kind of stuff um once you've taken a, a photograph of uh, an event you've kind of taken a photograph of every event almost so um yeah it can be quite interesting you meet some um, interesting people this is um vince cable um who was the Chancellor, Nicola Sturgeon. Um, I also do a lot of um, sort of PR and editorial stuff. So portraits, um, Elijah Wood, this is Gary Moore, some of you may recognize from Asai Records, he, he works in there now. Um, yeah, um, Adam Stafford, a musician from Falkirk, um, 
which was the um, Dundee, uh, no, the State of Print, sorry, at Generator, they did an exhibition there. So exhibition documentation, this is the print collective here. Um, so everything and anything. Um, if there's a budget, I'm interested. That tends to be the way it goes, especially in Dundee, um, where there isn't as much work. Um, for me, video is becoming more and more um, what I do, um, as opposed to photography. Um, it, when I started 10 years ago, it was, it was the kind of buzz thing that uh, photo, uh, video was you know, the new kind of growth industry, I suppose, within the, um, within the creative industries, because everyone wanted video for their, for their website. So I'm going to show you a film called Gardens, and this is about um, a couple in the hill town and what they did in their back garden during lockdown. So. Um, let me double check that we've got sound. Um, we'll go for stereo high fidelity. Is that coming through the sound okay? Yep. Before we started on the garden it was completely overgrown, you couldn't even see the top of the fence. The tree branches were right down to the bottom of the tree. It was so overgrown in the back of the garden that we thought it was one giant plant. We didn't realise there was lots of little bushes and trees in there, it was, it was a complete mess. We'd been talking about it for a while about doing something and then the situation that happened to, it, to the world came about and it granted us the opportunity to do something about it. We just thought we'd be able to clear it and it would look a bit nicer, but we managed to create a space that we were able to use, that the whole building was able to use. I think one of the things that was really good is we were able to use a lot of things that we already had to make the garden a nicer place. So there was, for instance, someone had put a bed frame out the back of the garden. We actually used the bed frame to create a vegetable patch. And then we used other bits of that wood to make a birdhouse. And then thanks to Tom's work, we were able to find more wood and build benches and planters. Because we didn't want new things. This was about using things and making things and making it interesting and wild. It wasn't about having a pretty garden for people to come and look at. We live opposite four very large multi-storey blocks of flats. So it's nice to have a nice quiet space, which is green, where the kids can come and play in safety and ask questions. And it's really nice to interact with all of the kids and the neighbours. And we've actually spoken to our neighbours more than we ever would have had we not done this and have actually made some really nice bonds with people and especially the children as well. Mm -hmm. all, the, all the children are playing together at the back for I think the first time since we've lived here and that's, I've been here about seven years so it's, yeah. it's a really lovely space. I shared all your strawberries with the kids in this <laughs> walk. They loved them. <laughs> And some of, because of that, some of the kids were like, we found strawberries, and they found some yeah, yeah, yeah. A little, tiny little wild strawberries down uh -huh. there, so they were eating all the looking grass. Yeah. I'm from the Philippines, and then coming here in the UK, and then I work in the hospital, then it, the garden make me happy, because after my duty, I stay in my garden before, before in, go inside my house. To, to relieve my stress and make my mind good. When I see the flowers is blooming, I feel very happy. We never knew anybody just behind us. And now we come out, you can sit up here, it's nice in the sun, you have a natter over the fence. I think it's become quite a bit of a focus for us, hasn't it? It's, it's and a focus for other people as well, you yeah. know. It's um, nice you can sit doing the dishes in the house and now you've got a nice space to look at, whereas before it just definitely wasn't anything to look at. It was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the only time I've ever heard someone say that it was nice to do the dishes. Mm -hmm. So, 
Um, there's another three films. Uh, one's on um, pigeon racing or pigeon fancying, um, and one is on um, skateboarding and BMXing, and the last one's on the model boats down at the Stobby, which is fantastic. It's uh, really, really interesting. Okay, so. Um, Oh no, it's okay. It's okay. Um, I have lots more stuff to share. <laughs> um, okay, so um, Sam provided us with a, a few questions for this. So I'm going to speak about fun a day and um, what it, I suppose what it means to me and you know what it is that I've done over the over the years. Um, so we first heard about fun a day in 2017. We were handed a flyer by Kirsty Dalton. Did you say? Um, uh, Pamela got a flyer at one of um, market. yeah one of our markets, um, so she was taking part, and I decided to take part because when we moved to Dundee um, in 2017, so it would have been August 2017. Um, my um, I, I had a lot of difficulty with my professional practice um, in transferring cities, and so I was uh, in a bit of a sort of creative crossroads. Um, so for me, Fun A Day has always been about trying new ideas um, and um, sort of addressing things that are going wrong or are causing difficulty within my practice. So in 2018, I started painting. Um, and this site here, um, when I eventually get around to redoing my websites, I'm going to amalgamate both sites together. But in 2018, I started this site um, as, a kind of, as an artist page, as a you know, as opposed to the photography and video page. Um, I think now it's, 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 it's time for them both to come together. But um, at the time I started this, that was how I was feeling. Um, and so painting, uh, the first project I did was um, using only primary colors, black and white. Uh, so I set myself a challenge of just working with a, a very small color palette and seeing where it ended up. Um, and these were the first proper paintings that I'd done. Um, since art school really so you know, that was like 15 years or something um, the next year I did uh, film photography um, so this is uh, an image here working with film working in the dark room no no I don't think so it may have been the other way around who knows <laughs> who knows Film photography, darkroom uh, printing. So using the the uh, the studio at the um, DCA. At the DCA. Wait, when was your lino cut? That was that year. That was the first year. Okay, so they were the other way around. <laughs> Thank you, Pamela. If you hadn't said anything, nobody would have known. <laughs> uh, the next year, I did painting again. Um, so uh, this was um, a painting that I did. Um, well, I finished, I suppose, for um, Fun A Day. This is called Lyrig. Um, so I kind of developed the, um, the practice along. I wouldn't have really called myself a painter at that point in time. It was only really until last year where I had an exhibition with Nicola Wiltshire that um, I kind of got to a point where I felt comfortable showing my work. Um, so the only time anyone had ever seen my painting was at Fun A Day. It was the only time they were ever shown until um, last year. Um, Last year for Fun of Day, I did um, lino cuts. So this wasn't one that I did, but it's it, it kind of shows the uh, the kind of the kind of work that I was doing. So working with lino cuts, I was also um, sort of playing around with music and upgrading a bass that I had. Um, so resoldering all the el the electrics and putting in new pickups and whatnot. Um, and this year I'm doing a project called In the Studio. So. Um, just minimize this. This is my little folder here. And so the idea with this one is because I've moved into this spare room and I'm starting to bring all of the elements of my practice together, was to actually just spend time in the studio and to go around the different um, sort of sections. So we have music, we have painting, um, we have the dogs, uh, lots of dogs. <laughs> and um, sort of being on the computer and, and whatnot. So it was really just to kind of keep it, um, exper you know, experimenting and see what happens. I also hadn't taken any photos for fun for over six months. So to get back to taking photos for myself was quite important. Um, so creativity for me at the moment, um, 
is, is, is really this. It's the amalgamation of all the different elements and hopefully getting to a point where I can just say artist and not have to have that qualifier of I'm an artist slash photographer type thing. Just to be an artist and to be able to dot around the various different projects that I do. Um, I, the current projects I have, I'm, I'm doing a, an online uh, photography course. Um, it's monthly. Uh, with Tayside Healthcare Arts Trust. I've got a few things going on at the McManus. We'll be doing a, a new, um, actually in-person education thing, which will be quite interesting. Um, a project that we did last year with the McManus and Tayside Healthcare is actually appearing at the Scottish Parliament next week, a cross-party group for uh, culture and communities looking at how um, arts education projects during the course of the pandemic helped people's health and well-being so that's something that i'm really interested in and hopefully we'll do more of in the future um the last question that sam gave us was advice for people looking to make a career out of what i do and if you like money don't do it <laughs> it's the big thing um you know there isn't a lot of money in it. It is an incredibly fulfilling career, but you have to be committed. It's a lifestyle choice more than anything, I would say. Um, I, I don't earn a lot from, from what I do, but I have an incredible amount of freedom in the jobs I can take on. And if I like um, working with people um, or I like what people are doing, then I can make time for it. And that's something that you know I was never able to do when I worked uh, in corporate work. Um, Tips I, I would give to people is to join a professional organization. Um, I can highly recommend Creative Dundee. They have an AMPS network and they're incredibly proactive about hooking people up and um, broadcasting the work that people do. Uh, when I started in Edinburgh, Creative Edinburgh were incredibly helpful. Um, and I wouldn't be where I am without Creative Edinburgh and Creative Dundee. Um, and I, I know that for an absolute fact. I'm also a member of the Scottish Artists Union, which is a handy thing. It's only six pound a month and uh, you get uh, your personal liability insurance. And they also have the rates of pay, um, which is uh, an incredibly useful thing, because if you put in a quote and then, um, you know, you're worried that it's going to be a little bit too high, but you say, but that's the Scottish Artists Union rates. Uh, nobody argues with you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, a professional organization. I'd also say be curious and experiment uh, and prepare. Make sure that you're prepared because um, when your chance comes, you need to act fast. Um, so my big break um, was working with the Edinburgh Film Festival and that was an incredibly fast turnaround. And what I'd done the previous year was really work on my skills so that when I was able to get something like that and you know, get access to a lot of sort of A-list celebrities and whatnot, um, my skills were um, at a point where I was able to take advantage of it. Um, so those are my tips, I suppose. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm Pamela. I'm an illustrator and printmaker um, and David's wife, in case that wasn't obvious. <laughs> um, I, um, I went to art college in Dundee. That's where we met. Um, we both graduated in 2006, um, but for almost 10 years, I pretty much did no work at all, um, apart from little bits here and there. Um, and it was, well, it was about 2015, um, I started just making little, you know, gifts for people, like birthday present, making a print or doing some cards here and there. And then uh, I kind of had, uh, I don't know, a, a group of maybe 10 prints that I was happy with. So I did like little markets and stuff to keep me going. And then um, David suggested I set up a website and social media, and that's when I opened my Etsy shop as well. Um, but I would say that it wasn't until we moved to, back to Dundee in 2017 that I started to, to really enjoy making work again. Um, and it was Christmas 2017 when I was doing that. It was, the, it was like the West Mini Market or something. It was in the, the library. Um, at Blackness Library, and I met Kirsty Dalton there. Um, I don't, you've probably seen some of her work in the in the hashtag. She does like the wood burning, um, really really cool stuff. But um, she gave me a little flyer for um, for Fun a Day, and I just thought it was a great kind of idea, that great way to kind of kickstart some kind of 
projects and I was thinking for ages and ages, oh, what should I do, what should I do? And I've enjoyed doing it every year. It's always like brought something new. I think David's about to share a link to Kirsty's page there. But, um, but yeah, anyway, where was I? Um, yeah, so 20, 2018 was the first year that I did Funny, Funny Day. And uh, it was one of, my first project was called Lino Cut Lyrics and it's become massive. I mean, I'd say about 80% of my sales on Etsy are Lino Cut with lyrics that I've done. So it's kind of actually like made my career <laughs> doing Funny Day. <laughs> If I can put it that way, um, but yeah, I do. I do a, a few different things. My main, like, favorite thing to do would be to to make lino cut prints. But I also do some painting um, and public art. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, Dundee Print Collective. And we do screen prints. Um, same as David. Well, not as much as David. I do some um, workshops as well. I do stuff with Tayside Healthcare Arts Trust. Um, I've done a few things with the. Um, Dundee Design Fest and then the Print Collective as well. We've done a few a few workshops, but um, yeah, I'm going to start off, but not this video. I want to show. Uh, I'll I'll show a pic a video of my kind of process of making a a lino cut. This is actually a really old video from when we were still living in Edinburgh. So it was probably 2015, possibly 2016. This was made, but it's the only one that I've got that I've had my professional videographer here make for me of an actual lino cut but um yeah i'll show you this just to show you the the kind of thing i do Yeah, so that, that's the kind of um, process I go through when I'm doing a lino cut. I usually start just with little thumbnail sketches um, 
in my sketchbook. I actually hate drawing, which is weird, I know, because I'm an illustrator, but um, I hate sketchbooking. That's probably a better way to put it. I prefer just to, to draw the thing straight onto the lino, and then I go over it in pen just in case I need to rub it away and then start my cutting from there. But um, yeah, that video was um, in our flat in Edinburgh. Um, so I, like I said, probably 2016. But um, the picture that's up now um, is the studio that I use now that David has moved out. <laughs> um, this is the, um, in the, I'll get the, the cursor. This is actually my new press. I was lucky enough in, what year would that have been? 20, 20? Yeah, 2019, I applied for some money through VACMA um, to get a new press. And the, the press that was in the video was a, a book press, which was great and, and did me well for however long I had it. But it was quite um, time consuming to use it because you need to like turn the wheel up and down each time and make sure it was lined up. It was quite small. You couldn't really do anything bigger than A4 um, on it. So um, I applied for money um, to get this new press, uh, this etching press, um, which is probably, I think it's about 120 centimetres long. I think it might be 50 centimetres wide. So it allows me to do a lot uh, bigger prints, um, but also for the for time, it's just easier to use because you just, it's basically a rolling pin in the middle and then the, the bed rolls back and forward. So it's um, it's amazing, I love it. Um, so if you're if you've got a, a project that you're thinking about or or uh, something that you want to try out, I, I recommend applying for VACMA. Um, not everyone's successful, and um, I would I wouldn't put it like don't get knocked if you're not successful. Just try and try again because you know they, they do it twice a year. Um, and there's one um, I think that's open till the first of February this year, and you can get grants of up to. Seven hundred and fifty pounds, um, or there's a five hundred pounds one as well. If you just graduated. If you just graduated, yeah. But um, the it was a lot more when I got this. I got double, so it pretty much paid for the whole press. So I was really <laughs> chuffed about that. But um, yeah, so that's my uh, studio from one view, and then this is the other way. Uh, nice and messy, just the way I like it. Um, and I'll, I'm just going to go through some of my lino cuts. This is um, one of the first ones I did after I got back into printmaking, and I actually use this as my logo. Um, I call it Bird on Branch, so it is. <laughs> um, but with my lino cuts, um, there's kind of three main things that I do. Um, I work on commissions. Um, this one was for a, a band that David actually did a lot of photography for and um, we used this on, um, what would it be, like the CD? Mm -hmm. It wasn't it wasn't the album cover, but it was on the CD. Um, and then someone else actually um, licensed to use it um, as band merch, but it was a different band and I checked it was okay. Um, and it's one of my favourite prints I've ever made. Um, this one was a um, a logo for um, a fitness instructor who based in Edinburgh, uh, On Track Fitness, I think it was called. So um, I tried to get a wee bit of Edinburgh in the background and then the the running track in front of her. Um, this one was really cool. The the um, the guy who it was for, it was a retirement present, and he was he, he researched some kind of um, brain. What was it? It was like a IST, some stroke thing anyway. And then they wanted a portrait of the family. They wanted Edinburgh and he had loads of traveling for um, for his job. So just trying to get everything all together. Like a lot of the same people just give me a list of stuff that they would like in the, the print and just let me go wild with it. So this one, I managed to get the brain, statistics, the world, planes, the family, Edinburgh, books and stuff. So um, graphs. A graph there. Yeah, yeah, that's like the statistics. Um, what's the next one? This one um, isn't really personalised in any way, but because um, they only wanted me to make one, um, I haven't sold anywhere anywhere else. This is an East Point in the, on, on the Isle of Skye, and I believe um, they got engaged down there. Um, what's next? Yeah, so the, the second kind of part of my line of cuts are Dundee-based. Um, I sell a lot of these in um, 
in the shop. So I've got work in um, five shops in and around Dundee and um, they're probably my, my biggest kind of sellers in those, those places. Some of them I do as greetings cards as well. Um, I, I t don't tend to do um, big uh, set editions of my prints, so I just keep printing more and more. So I call them open editions. And um, as long as the lino hasn't worn away, I'll just keep printing them. Um, so this one's um, a view into Dundee from Wormit Bay. Um, oh yeah, David, David's just writing what shops uh, I'm in. So they're in Dundee, I'm in Kist and Dock Street Studios. In um, Perth, there's the um, Tayberry Gallery. Um, Broughty Ferry is Pretty Fly Workshop and um, Carnoustie. Hame, which is quite a new shop, but she, she sells quite a lot of my stuff. It's amazing. I grew up in Carousey, so maybe that's why. Uh, yeah, so this one um, was one of our lockdown walks. We went down to Malcolm Green and I took a picture of this. And there's obviously like some students been sitting on the sign or a car smashed into it. So the sign is actually bent. Um, it's not my weird cutting. <laughs> um, yeah, this is just kind, a kind of made up skyline but this one I've printed onto bags and um, and it's quite one of my most popular ones and then I've done a series of kind of Dundee buildings and um, the Phoenix is probably my most popular one out of those for prints and and for cards just uh, sold one of those the other day actually and then Grouch was RIP um, and <laughs> that one's quite popular as well and then the third thing I do of my lino cuts is uh, all the lino cut lyrics. So this started with Funny Day um, and then just went wild. Um, I, I wasn't, when I did Funny Day, I wasn't even really thinking of selling things, but um, I think it was the first print I did. Um, somebody asked if I was going to be selling them. I was like, well, maybe I should put these up. And then I just, the project just grew and grew and then I get requests probably every week for, for different songs. And if I think it's going to be popular enough, I will, um, I'll cut it and I'll, I'll sell, sell them on Etsy. Um, if it's one that somebody wants personalised, they'll charge a wee bit more and won't sell multiples of them. But yeah, this one um, is a Tom Waits song, Alice. Um, this one's actually an album rather than a song. It's um, the first Bon Iver album for Emma forever ago and it's got the track list. Uh, this is a song by Pearl Jam, um, Rats, and then this is uh, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, Push the Sky Away. Uh, and then the Gaslight Anthem, they're probably, um, you probably see that on the drawing cam. Uh, Gaslight Anthem, um, I don't know, I pro probably about, I don't know, 70% of the stuff I sell on Etsy is Gaslight Anthem prints. Um, so this is one of, one of their songs, but I've probably done about, how many, about 12, 12, 13, oh, at least, at 14, least, uh, 15, yeah. maybe 20 of their songs, because people keep asking for different ones. Um, and this, if you've seen the, the picture, the, the PDF that we sent, there we go, thanks, Kirsty. Um, this is what kicked off my record player um, design. I think I've probably done about, oh, I'd say 15 different songs on records because people keep asking for this design with different lyrics. So I, I, I do it and I've done so many that I can cut it really quickly now. But yeah, the, the, um, the lyrics, this one is we sing with our heroes 33 rounds per minute. So that kind of fit in with the record. And now people ask me for any lyrics, but um, yeah. Uh, right, so what's next? Oh yeah, so the, the kind of, another big part of my work is doing public art. Um, this was my first one that I ever did, it, probably the first time I'd ever drawn anything bigger than A4. Um, <laughs> this was um, Open Close Stops Well in 2018. Um, I put in an application, they, they did a call out for, for these doors. I put in an application about two hours before it closed. Um, I was humming and hawing and David's like, just draw something. Um, so this is probably how like most of my public art projects happen. Like there is a call out and um, a selection panel will go through everything. And I, I've just been really fortunate to have been selected for a few different things. I mean, there's been plenty that I've applied for that I get rejected 
and that's just one of the things about about these kinds of projects you know you're you're not going to get everything but um yeah this lovely photo was taken by my my husband david <laughs> um which most of them are um the same year um i the second public art project I did was the penguin and um, so this was the first time drawn on something which was a, a weird shape and um, my one was um, up in Brecon um, outside the community centre um, and then it was outside the McManus for for a week or, or so before the, the auction. Um, this wasn't a call out um, but the the company that commissioned this one, they'd seen the open close um, Stobswell Trail and selected uh, a group of artists from there to decorate their offices um, with art. It was just this big long corridor, it was really boring. Um, and they commissioned us to create artworks for the, it was like the staff entrance, just so it wasn't this plain white wall. So I don't actually have a full picture of this, but this was a seven and a half meter long Dundee skyline. It's on my website though, um, if you want to have a look. Um, and then I was applied again for, for the Orwilly Big Bucket Trail and was accepted. Um, and my design was a kind of um, made up, um, what, what I would picture Ock and Sugar, where Willie's from, to look like. And so I just drew these like, houses and stuff all over and then nice blue sky, sunny, sunny shirt on. Um, and then, oh yeah, this one, another photo by David. Um, I don't know, some, some of you might have seen this. This was in the Wellgate. This was um, the Dundee Windows project. So that was another call out um, where I put in a design and, um, and got selected. Um, this one was really difficult to do because there was only about a meter that I could step back and I had to keep going all the way out into the back of the well gate to come out the front to see if things were straight, to see if things like needed moved over a bit. And then obviously, because it's on a window, I had to draw everything backwards. But um, that's fine, because I'm used to that with lino cuts anyway, because you have to draw it backwards. Um, and I've got a, a video of the making of this, um, this window and um, it's not as slick as the other video because I edited this one <laughs> so it won't, it won't be as uh, as good as the one that David made for me but um, we'll just get that I'll just show that it's not as long as well so this is me drawn backwards on the window <laughs> Yeah, so um, that one was really fun to do, um, and I've I've had a, a couple other ones that I haven't put photos up here, but most of them are on the the website. But um, yeah, most most of these projects I'll I'll paint with um, acrylic paint and then Posca on top. So that window was all um, Posca onto the window. Um, this is that is that up on screen? Uh, yeah, this is my most recent um, public art project, which I finished on Thursday. Um, it's in a toilet. <laughs> um, there's a, a new restaurant open. It's just off the A90, just outside of Brecon. Um, and they've, I mean, it was a restaurant before, but the new owners have taken it over and spruced it up. And they wanted to make the toilets a kind of talking point um, or a nice place to be. And they want to win Lou of the Year awards and, and whatnot. Um, so my, my toilet was themed Brecon. Um, so there's loads of buildings from, from Brecon. And then 
Louise Kirby and Laura Darlin did the other two cubicles and they're themed our Brooks and Forfer. But um, yeah, it was pretty intense and I have to say that it's kind of made me not be able to do my fun day project this week because I've been in a toilet all week. <laughs> but um, but yeah, going on to, to fun day, here's my admit one, you might remember this Sam from 2017 slash 18. Um, this was my um, admission to, to join fun day. Um, I think I actually had heard about it before. Um, the year before, just seeing things on social media and stuff, because I definitely recognised the name, but it wasn't really on my radar because we, we were still living in Edinburgh the, the previous January. But um, yeah, we, as soon as I saw it, I was like, I know what that is, I want to do it. Um, so yeah, that was my, my kind of first ever fun of day um, post. But I'm actually going to go through my projects in reverse order. Um, so this year, um, my theme is uh, January blues. Um, I'm just using the colour blue as my theme. There's no kind of um, restrictions on it. I didn't want to get tied into to one thing and end up hating it. So um, last, not last week, but the week first week one, I did a little bit of painting, um, and I just had scraps of jute that I used. This was just. 20 minutes. Um, I have to do some lino because I love lino and stick with the lyrics theme. Um, I wanted to have a kind of sub theme with the with the lyrics so I'm trying to find a song with each month of the year. So this first one is Last January by The Twilight Sad. Um, I also got this um, light, what is it, light? Um, light sensitive light paper. Sensitive paper. So it's kind of like doing a cyanotype, but without the chemicals. Um, so I was just playing about with that. I want to actually get the it mastered by the end of the month because it says leave for five minutes, but then I think that's in like California sunshine and not Dundee winter. <laughs> so um, I was just messing about with that. Um, my second line of cut was um, February Stars by the Foo Fighters. Um, this is another one of my um, light sensitive paper. This one worked slightly better, but not quite how I was expecting it. Uh, March was late March, Death March by Frightened Rabbit. And yeah, this was a nice kind of blue photo that I took when I out, out for a walk with the dogs. Um, I'm also planning to hopefully do some, maybe some screen printing, definitely more painting and um, maybe some colographs um, with my blue ink. Um, can, I, can I interrupt? Um, Pamela mentioned the scraps of jute. Um, if anybody's interested, um, we get them from Scrap Antics. Mm. And it's a hell of a lot cheaper than buying proper canvas for paintings. Um, so I use them um, just stretched onto pieces of wood. Um, and it gives you a nice um, texture. Let when take the screen share. Oh. I'll stop share for a second. Yeah, it gives a nice texture to the um, to the canvas. Um, yeah, it's just just jute. And they sell it for I think it's like it's like three pounds a meter or something yeah, like that. Yeah, you get hundreds so, of it. Um, it's very very cheap and very very good. Um, and you can buy the uh, stretchers from I get them from Jackson's Art, and they're um, it's a lot cheaper than buying sort of box canvases and, and whatnot. So they're a little tip. Mm -hmm. Right, so what year am I on now? 2021. 20, um, probably like everyone else, um, I was missing going on holiday by the time we got to January last year. So I themed my um, project on places that I'd been on holiday. Um, I also wanted to try um, doing some colographs. I don't think I'm doing, I did it right, but I quite like the result. Um, so the first one was uh, Beach Huts in Brighton. Um, and me being me, I couldn't not do a lino cut. So I did the same thing again as a, as a lino cut as well. Um, the second one I did, this was a, a, the Isle of Skye. So this one I called Sky Cottage. Um, we, we've been to Skye a few times and it's just beautiful up there. 
and this is kind of what the cottage looked like that we stayed in, not really, but yeah. <laughs> um, and that was the, the line clip version of it. Um, this one was Berlin. Um, it's supposed to look like a bottle top because if you've ever been to Berlin, the cobbled streets are just absolutely covered in bottle caps. You can drink in the streets, so people just like take the bottle cap on and they just get stamped into the cobbles. Um, and they're just everywhere. I just think, think it's beautiful. Um, and then that was the lino cut version of that. Uh, what was this? This one was Bristol. So that's the um, Clifton suspension bridge in, in Bristol. Um, we went there, was it two years after we were married? Three years? Yeah, and you were too scared to go out. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't cross it. I don't know if you've been to Bristol, but there's like this death drop underneath the, the suspension bridge. I think I got about a metre on. I was like, nope, went back. Uh, yeah, and then line cut version of that as well. Um, this one is Copenhagen. Um, we didn't really like it there, to be honest. It was far too clean. I like my cities with a wee bit of graffiti and dirt everywhere. It was, uh, I mean, it was lovely and it was really expensive, but it, it, I don't think I would go back. Um, this colograph, I wasn't really happy with how it turned out. Um, so that's the, the line version. And then the last one was Paris. So that's us having a picnic in Paris because instead of having to spend loads of money on lots of meals out, we would always have a picnic at lunchtime and then go out at, uh, at evening. Um, I quite like this choreograph actually. Um, and then that one is the uh, Lino Cup. Okay. 2020, um, I decided to do some painting um, and every time I do painting, I think that I should be doing more um, and then never get around to doing it. So maybe this year is the year I will do more painting. But um, there were just imagined cityscapes. Um, I didn't actually do that many. Um, sorry for this terrible photo. Um, I just took a screenshot off Instagram because I couldn't, I couldn't find the original photo. Um, but yeah, this project was imagined cityscapes. Um, so it was just painting, making up stuff, and then drawing on top of it in Posca. Um, I quite like this one. Somebody asked me if this was Baxter Park Terrace, so why not? But I made up. <laughs> um, yeah, so some of these were quite big, and some of them were small. So some of them I spent like three or four. I think there was one I actually spent six days on. Um, so I was doing fun every day. <laughs> it was just not 31 things. Um, this one was big. I think that one was 16 by 12 centimetres. What did I miss one? No. Uh, that was a box canvas. The, the sides were actually done on that one. Uh, and that was my last one for, the, for that year. So I quite enjoyed those and you can see how that's kind of gone into some of my public art stuff that I've done. Um, because what year was that? 2020. So yeah, yeah, going into doing the, the Dundee windows and even the, the toilet that I just finished is in a similar style to that. Uh, 2019, um, my project was Dundee streets. These were all seven by five canvases, um, just with acrylic paint and Posca. Um, this one is Meadowside, just the side of the Elgate. And then Shepherd's Lone, looking down into the river. Uh, oh, what's that one? This one's in Logie. Is it Logie Avenue? Um, the street at the back, that would be Scott Street. The back of the Scott Street flats. Uh, this one was not far from where we stayed, just off the law. So you can see Cox's stack in the background. Uh, that's looking into Fluker Street. That was my walk to work. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's a nice picture, snap that. Uh, the Hilltown, Hilltown Clock. That was just near where we stayed as well, looking up into the law. Um, that's down, coming from Wasps, there's the, the wee mill, is it Milne Street? And then everybody's favourite multi-storey building. <laughs> uh, the Caird Library, that one's just off um, the Perth Road. Uh, and then Riverside Drive. 
And there, there's me at the Funny Day exhibition, the last in-person one we could have uh, with, my, with my paintings. And then, last but not least, this was my first ever Funny Day project back in 2018. I did um, 20 line of cuts. I, think, I don't think I did it all in January. I think I was about halfway into February by the time I'd actually cut them all, but I was on a mission to get a certain amount. And I was like, I can't stop mid line of cut. Um, so yeah, I'll quickly go through them. This one is an Evil Nine song called Crooked. Uh, Nick Cave, Chupolo. Um, this is the Pixies, Monkey Gone to Heaven. Uh, PG Harvey, Down by the Water. Uh, Die the Flu by Deftones. Uh, Letters by Lyra Lynn. Am I going too fast? I don't know. Uh, this is the last time by the National. Um, Keep the streets empty by Fever Ray. Uh, a forest by the Cure. This was one of David's songs um, that he recorded many many years ago called Old Kit Joe. Old Kit Joe and David's uh, moniker at the time was the Starstruck Troubadour. <laughs> uh, I think you freaky by Diane Antwerp. A Bachelorette by Bjork, a 1979 by The Smashing Pumpkins, a Blake Says by Amanda Palmer, a Black Balloon by The Kills, nearly there, honest. <laughs> he Took Her to the Movie by Lady Tron, a Tip Tapping by Dylan. Uh, the Moon Asked the Crow by Coco Rosie. Must be nearly at the end. Um, 50 Words for Snow by Kate Bush. And uh, Cold Days from Birdhouse by the Twilight Squad. I'm pretty sure that's the last one. And me at the first ever uh, Funny Day exhibition. Um, so they were all quite small. They were like, oh, yay, yay, just a good one. Um, I think they were all six by four lino cuts. So, um, even though they were small, it did take me a bit longer than the um, the month of January, but I got really into it. And like I said, that's kind of most of the basis of my business now. Um, the reason I went in reverse order, because you probably saw the, the drawing activity was kind of music based. Um, I've got the, the two PDFs that, um, that I drew up earlier, you could either add lyrics from your favorite song to them or you could color in or i've got a couple of songs and um, which kind of feature radio slash vinyl lyrics that you could use if you're wanting to do that um, i was going to do a, a drawing and you can either copy me or you can just make something up yourself like if you've got a design in mind that for a song that you like but um i don't know if you want to do questions first or drawing first I think we'll do some questions first. Yeah. Um, jump back through the chat. As well. Yeah, there's um at the very at the very start of the chat, there's that Dropbox link for the PDFs. So if you want to download them, and um, while we're going over the questions, feel free. Um, Kirsty, do you want to start the first one? Yeah, of course. So lots um and if anyone else has one um just maybe pop it in the chat or indeed raise your hand i think you can do that in uh zoom yeah, yeah, emojis the themes um and you can speak it out yourself so uh first question is for david any favorite memories of photographing certain events that stand out personally to you and was there any personal project of yours that you got to spend time focusing on because of lockdown? Uh, the second question would be painting. Um, I, I used it to catch up um, on um, things that were unfinished. So I usually have five or six on the go at the, the, the same time. Uh, the one I showed, I've just finished. So I've got four still to finish and then I've got a few other ideas. So they kind of stay in the wall for a, a, a while. So lockdown was really good for that. Um, 
I've also built the music studio. So um, I have various different bits of kit. It's a kind of modular setup with various mixers, instruments that come and go. Um, so that was all um, sort of re researched and established in lockdown. Favourite memories would probably be, um, I mentioned the film festival because it, um, it gave me a start and it meant that when I showed my portfolio, people would take it seriously as opposed to it just being pictures of my friends or family and whatnot. I think when, when you start out, you can be quite self-conscious that you don't have enough work. Um, so getting a, an event like that, um, you know, it gave me confidence. And in that vein, Tea in the Park, I did in 2013 and 2014. Um, that also gave me a, a, a kind of a boost in confidence, really. And it, it showed me that I could um, I could do what I was saying I could do. I, you know, I was able to prove myself, really. So. No. Um, and then off the back of that as well, I suppose, um, Sam was asking, do you plan the way you film specifically with editing in mind? No. <laughs> uh, no, it, it's important to me that um, if, if if you're too if you're too tight to your plan, um, that there, there's a saying in military circuit, cir circles that um, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Um, you 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 can make a plan, but you have to be able to let it go um, if things don't work out that way. Um, so my focus is on the relationships and the conversations with the people I'm working with. Um, you know, I might have a, a shot in mind, like for, a, a, you know, for example, the Stobswell film, a digger coming down the street. But if it's not safe for me to stand where I thought I would stand, I have to change up. So I'll try and capture things in two or three different ways. Um, and then when I'm editing, it'll be kind of looking over the footage, listening to the music that I'm using, or the, the, there's always a spine that runs through a film, whether it's a piece of music or if it's an interview or, or, or whatnot. It, they was really good at like getting things in time with the music, but really subtly. So we both kind of laughed when I showed my Lino Cup um, video because there's a bit where um, where I flick a bit of Lino away and it's in time, and then a bit where I use the the toothbrush to wipe away some of the the scraps, and it's like mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, or things like the the guy with the shovel, he he shovels it on the beats yeah. and stuff like that. Or there's a bit with a pencil that's tapping on the side yeah, that it's, goes it's, in. It's not like really annoying like Master Chef. But it's like, <laughs> I don't know if everyone's noticed that Master Chef, but they're chopping in time with music. Oh, that me mad. Anyway. Yeah, they call it Mickey Mouse in. So it's like Mickey Mouse where everything goes in time, so the, in time with the music. Yeah. Um, but I, it, the, the edit is, is, is it's its own thing. Um, and for me, it's about, cap when I'm on site, it's about capturing the footage, capturing the best footage that's possible within the conditions that are there. Um, while maintaining the best relationships with the people that are there. Uh, there's nothing worse than a filmmaker coming in with all the kit and just causing this massive ruckus. Um, yeah, I, I, I like Footprint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, one of the things I really admire about the both of you is that you, you're bringing this beautiful light and creativity to Dundee. And you both seem to really, you know, like, find beauty in the most mundane parts of it and you're sort of like <laughs> making it I don't know making it shine and so one of the questions here is whether you both grew up in Dundee but obviously Pamela you said Carnoustie did you say mm. yeah yeah I, I grew up in Carnoustie but I moved up here um, when I was 18 um, but I was always in Dundee like you know town every weekend hanging outside Virgin when it was still at the back of the Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then we met at art college. David grew up on the west coast. Ah, okay. yeah, yeah, well, not I'm, really. You were you were everywhere. I moved around a lot. Um, so Lanarkshire, Stirling, Glasgow, mm -hmm. Newcastle, um, and then I was at college in Glasgow, and um, I applied to Dundee because um, when in two thousand one, when I was at college, Dundee was seen as the the kind of the upstart, the the kind of up and coming place, whereas um, Glasgow and Edinburgh art schools were seen, and it was you had to apply for you had to apply for a first choice and a second choice, but you would only ever get your first choice. No one ever got their second choice. Mm -hmm. So I went with Dundee because I wanted to be where the the underdog was, and Aberdeen was just too far. So Grays was mm -hmm. out, um, yeah. 
so yeah, we met at art school. And but but I, I actually hated Dundee for a while. We left, we left, lived in Edinburgh for 10 years. And I think it's just because I grew up here. I knew it, was, it wasn't so much about the place or what was happening. It was all the ghosts. Everywhere, everywhere I turned, I would see somebody. I was like, oh yeah, they've seen me be sick because I was just drunk <laughs> through uni the whole time. <laughs> but, um, but when I came back, like, I'd always be back visiting family and friends and stuff. And when we came back, it's just like we, we feel like we're home now. It's just, uh, yeah. I, I always really like being here now. I always wanted to move back because I think Dundee has... Um, it's it, just the right size. It is, and it has a wonderful community. Mm -hmm. And the um, the creative scene in Dundee now is amazing. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. There was nothing when we graduated. Yeah, when we were at art school, there was no um, there was no business. Uh, you know, there was no conversations about how to set up a business or anything like that. There was very little um, in the way of um, opportunities or support. I think Creative Dundee started in like 2008 or something like that. So it was after we had graduated when these things started to come in. Mm -hmm. um, and nowadays there's just so much support. Um, and it is, it is possible to have, I mean, we were both full time um, creatives. So, um, you know, everything that you see here was paid for by art, um, which never ceases to amaze us. Yeah. Um, but Dundee, you can do that. You can, you know, you can support yourself if you're if you can't, can't mm -hmm. It's really admirable. It really is. Um, mm -hmm. And feeds nicely into the next question, which is what did you do before you became artists full time? And what are the difficulties about being freelance? <laughs> what did you do before? I was going to say, what didn't David do? He did everything. <laughs> um, when, when we were in Edinburgh, I, I pretty much just worked in pubs. I was managing, supervising pubs and restaurants for. 10 years. Um, when we moved back to Dundee, I had a full-time job um, just, just uh, in a restaurant. I wasn't any kind of management, um, just so that when, when we moved, I, I knew I didn't want any responsibility because I know, knew it would take away from being able to do my creative work outside of work. Um, and then just gradually over the years, I cut down my shifts. I started at 40 hours, went down to 30, and then I was just down to two days. And then it was just September, just past that I went full time freelance. I mean, it was just a minimum wage job, did what any any responsibility. Um, and I suppose a kind of combination of lockdown and just getting too old to be running about in a restaurant for uh, 10 hours a day kind of made me decide to actually give this a go full time. And it's been going fine so far. Um, but yeah, I would never, I would always, if somebody asked me, like family and friends, like when they asked about my life, I wouldn't want them to ask me about how the pub was or how the restaurant was. Like, oh, that's just something I do to, you know, pay the rent. Um, so now it's nice when somebody asks me how work's going, I actually want to talk about it. So yeah, that's why I did it. The, the, <laughs> the job I had before going freelance was I worked in a call center for HSBC and had um, what can only be described as a mental breakdown and was signed off sick for a long, long time. And I went freelance because I couldn't go back, but the way that the economy was, it was uh, in the middle of the banking crash and whatnot. There weren't any other jobs, so mm -hmm. I was forced into it. Um, so I kind of had my back against the wall. Um, before that, I ran an off license and was made redundant in 2009. Mm -hmm. and had lots of kind of odd jobs in between that but I've I've had over 50 jobs in, in my life I've been a pot wash I've used to be a trolley dolly on the east coast the mainline on the trains <laughs> um you know lifeguard lots of random stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so so, well. yeah. anything that pays the rent anything so, that pays the rent yeah, yeah. um but um I mean the freelance is it's not for everyone it's a lifestyle mm -hmm. I said that before um like I'm, I'm quite open about the fact that we we, we don't earn a lot of money. Um, like both, um, like all of our siblings, uh, each individually earn more than we do together. Um, mm -hmm. And that is that's quite a commitment. We don't have kids. Um, I don't actually think we could afford to have kids, even if we wanted them. Um, we live in Curtin, which um, doesn't have the best reputation. Um, so you, you have to go where um, housing is cheap. Um, mm -hmm. 
you have to uh, you have to cut your cloth accordingly and you have to be committed uh, which is mm -hmm. i suppose the most difficult thing is um co yeah committing to it and you're trusting in the fact that the relationships you've built and the people that you've spoken to and the clients that you have um they'll continue to bring work like for example mm -hmm. my diary i have this today i'm speaking at the parliament on wednesday next week and i don't have anything else after that nothing nothing empty until i have one job in february so um but we, yeah. we used to we used to worry when it was like that but now it now we know something will come along because that's just how it how it always seems to be but we you know keep money aside just in case things are quiet yeah. but um yeah it, it it can be tough but i mean you could make a, a probably a decent living out of it if you were working all the time but because some of the jobs are so intense you need time off you know i just did five days in a row in a toilet like about two inches from a from the wall which if you were in like, like and getting paid to do it which is great but if you were just working normally you probably would have done it over the course of like a month mm -hmm. but because of the the deadlines and time skills you work to yeah um it's intense so you need to have the, the time away so it's, it's good that you, you you can take a break but i know some people who work all the time and they're they always just seem on edge but they're probably making half de decent living but there's there's always the thing that you could be like over exposed as well like you don't want to be everywhere you don't want to do every job and you know people get sick of you you need to keep things fresh and stuff yeah, as the, well i mean the question said difficulties um, and <laughs> this, is, this is a tiny tiny part of it because i wouldn't do anything else yeah um i mean i i've had a couple of wobbles where i've tried to get jobs in 2018 i applied for over 50 jobs 51 jobs i think it was um and yeah didn't get any mm -hmm. um because i'd been freelancing for so long it just you know you become unemployable really but um i mean i can have a nap whenever i want i can go out with the dogs <laughs> whenever i want and um, the the fridge is just literally over there so i can eat whenever i want um you know you can't do that when you have a corporate job so yeah. there's so much going for it and you know this is state as well at the weekends but during school hours it's silent um so our mortgage is very small and you know if you can work and you can arrange your work uh, you know with what the, the rest of the estate's doing um you know it's it's fine um, and it works um yeah <laughs> that's such an interesting answer to that question <laughs> no. <laughs> no no genuinely you've been able to sort of really balance out the positives and the negatives and it's admirable the uh, just the gumption and the the dedication i think you said yourselves that it must take to to make that work i'm trying to picture david on a train now uh, <laughs> <yeah. laughs> <Weekend> on. <laughs> <laughs> Any snacks or refreshments? <laughs> oh, you still got it. <laughs> um, Pamela, do you do you make your images up or do you use inspiration? How do you come up with your style? And I think another question linked to it. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find you take photos of locations as part of your process? Would like you know, photography ends up playing a role behind the scenes? It, it definitely does. I mean, it depends really what, what I'm doing. Um, if it's, um, they say like one of the, the murals, like, like the one I just finished, um, I, I like to work for my own photographs when I can. So I tend to go out and just take photos on my phone and I will draw from, from those. Um, sometimes when I've done stuff where I haven't actually visited the place, I don't quite know if I've got it right, even though it never like, looks exactly like it because it's in my style. But um, but yeah, I do tend to work from photos and start off with little sketches in my sketchbook. But if it's a lino, I'll draw um, in detail on the lino first. Um, with the the lyrics, I tend to actually write the whole song lyrics out and pick out what I think would be best, and I try and find some imagery um, that's in the song already. Um, 
depending on what it is, I'll sometimes like Google images. Like if I'm like, oh, what does like, for example, my um, my radio that I've done the PDF. I was like, what what order are the buttons in actually on a tape player? So <laughs> I'll, I'll look up stuff like that. But I don't like copying um, other people's images where possible. But sometimes um, I do need to look stuff up for reference. Um, so some of the, the paintings I've done, they just come from the top of my head, you know, I'll just go wherever it takes me, you know, I don't um, copy things for those, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I used to, David used to do a lot of photography for me, um, but now I'm doing more of it myself, um, and for reference, it's definitely my photos. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was... yeah else at the bottom is it related to this yeah is there where does your interest in buildings and locations come from because that definitely seems quite yeah you know I don't know I think it, it's just it's I think it's like you know kind of wandering about I'm always just like looking up and I just like notice little things like or even looking down like the you know like drain covers and stuff I'm always just fascinated by the little things that kind of um make up buildings you know I, I, it must just be something from when I was younger just like sitting in the back of the car watching the world go by it's just I always notice buildings and I mean I hate drawing people you'll probably see that hardly any of my stuff's got people in it so I have to have some kind of uh, yeah thing that I do all the time but um I mean Dundee's probably one of the best places there's Rosie uh for looking up like there's so many different styles of architecture and stuff when you have a look about, but I don't, I don't really know where it came from. It's just something I like. <laughs> it's definitely you make Andy shine because of it, that's for sure. Yeah, you think? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and then we've got here, what is your favourite, what's your favourite part of the lino print process? Not the sketch, um, you said. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, it's weird, like, being an illustrator and not actually really liking sketching, but... Um, I would say probably the carving out process is my favourite because it's almost like you can just like go away and, and it's like thinking time. There's not really a lot of concentration has to go into it. You can listen to the radio or a podcast or some music and just like you're just following the lines. Uh, I, th I think when you're when you're sketching out or printing, you need to pay a bit more attention. Um, but yeah, definitely the carving out is my my favourite. We've got we've got two awake dogs now. <laughs> Where's the other one? He's down here. Oh, okay. And Millie's in bed upstairs. Yeah, we have three dogs. Three dogs. My yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hello. Has um, anyone else got any questions they want to directly ask at all? No. Well, we can maybe um, crack on with um putting some lyrics oh, Amy. Oh, 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 I panicked and waved oh, oh, no. <laughs> as, though I, as though I'd never been in a, vir in a virtual meeting before ever <laughs> <laughs> after working from home since like uh, since March 2020 um so yeah so I work in the corporate and uh, I'm at home next to the yeah this is my corporate gear now um yeah I was just wondering when you were at university do uh, am I I've, I come from a science background but do they actually teach you about being freelance or setting up a business or anything like that, which I would have thought, would, especially within the arts field, would be quite important? They, they don't. They no. didn't when we were there. I think they do now um, because yeah. certainly younger people that I work with um, at the you know the Young Photo Club at the DCA and whatnot, people they're, they're very much switched on in a way that we weren't. Uh, at least I certainly wasn't. It took a long, long time to yeah to figure it out. Um, I mean, even now, I still feel like I'm trying to figure it out. But I, I don't remember getting told anything, or even anything about pricing, or you know who to get in touch with. There was absolutely nothing. It was, uh, it was all just about actual processes. Like yeah, but that's why that's why it's incumbent on people like us who are at the stage we're at now to be open about things and to to say well you know this is how much you should be charging an hour and mm -hmm. you know you know there's um yeah there's nothing hidden about it and and they really could have done with teaching us mm -hmm. teaching us mm -hmm. that 
Um, and even things like contracts, uh, there are a lot of sort of boilerplate contracts out there if you know where to find them. Um, but if you don't, you can get yourself into kind of sticky situations mm. with copyright. and Because there's that. nothing more awkward than speaking about money. You know, <laughs> you, you just, it always feels weird. No matter, no matter how many times you've done it, you're like bringing it up face to face with someone is always going to be weird because you're like, please help me survive. You know? <laughs> but also the thing is that to do what we do, you, you can't be motivated by money. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, th th these are, it's almost like a hypothetical figure. When I, when I price up a job, it, you know, like, you know, a thousand pounds or 500 pounds, it, it doesn't mean a thousand pounds. Um, you know, like when I was at the bank, a thousand pounds was, you know, a good month. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, it, you know, now it doesn't really, you know, make sense. You, you pinpoint your pricing to, professional organizations who mm -hmm. you speak to people um, you know you can have conversations about rates with you know fellow photographers or artists or, or whatnot mm -hmm. um, and yes yeah, it's, it's an about, abstract thing and you also mentioned about the copyright how you protect your work because I've yeah there seems to be that seems to be a massive thing and if someone's got what can it's just it's something part of my job we talk, um, sometimes work with artists and we have some of these conversations and i just i just find it interesting how how that obviously like that that because it is your work is you and that's where you earn your living from and i know um i've got um somebody a colleague somebody i know who makes pin badges and they have and they keep getting comp people who copy exactly oh, copy yeah, their designs yeah. and then sell them cheaper yeah. um and things like that there's 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 a lot of that about um with photography, uh, when I was doing music photography, I used to get my image, images stolen all the time. But my trick with photography now is to take really boring pictures that are only of use to the client. Uh, so, you know, like, uh, you know, if you're documenting an event, then, you know, it's only the people that run in the event that would want the pictures. Um, and with paintings, um, no one can replicate the, the physical object that mm -hmm. I've because I, I think the reason I started painting again, well, one of the reasons was um, photography had become disposable to me. Um, you know, I, I, would, I would go into an event, I would take photographs and then I would hand them over and I, wouldn't, I, I didn't really have a, a connection with them. I, I wasn't precious about them. Because mm -hmm. you have to be like that when you're working with clients because it's what they want, it's not what you want. And so mm -hmm. paintings became this tangible object that you know, I could put up on my wall and you could copy the design, but it wouldn't look exactly the same. So I use really small brushes and I layer up the paint so the, the surface is all kind of bumpy. And there's usually four or five different paintings underneath. Um, and I spend a long time on them. But I think with like copyright and stuff, places like the Artist Union can help with that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. I'm lucky that nobody's stolen my work that I know of, but at, at, at the same as you, there's, there's people I know who their work ends up on like t-shirts and like some mm. random place in China or something, you know, or somebody actually was it, what was her name, Michelle, like it was in a top shop, took one of her mm. designs or something. It's, wow. Um, and she, she was trying to fight them, but she's like, I, I just can't afford to take top <laughs> shop to, to court. And she was just getting so stressed, stressed about it. But I, I did, I did do an interview. I wrote an article about a band once and the Metro newspaper stole oh, yeah. my interview. Mm -hmm. and had to print a, an apology the next week so um, which apparently they don't usually do so um, mm -hmm. it has it does happen but you can't be precious about it and um, you know you have to I suppose draw a line at some mm -hmm. point I mean I, I would never reverse search any of my images I just I don't want to know it's, mm -hmm. it just causes too much anxiety yeah. um, it's not it's not worth it there's there's not there's not much you can do about it so well, how do you copyright your I mean, especially... you can copyright images, uh, you can register them. Um, but I mean, by the, by the fact that you took it, it's yours. You take a photo with your phone and um, yeah, the, the law is that you own the copyright. To that. Mm -hmm. like on our website, we, we've got the copyright yeah. thing at the bottom. So it's kind of, it's there. The, but... the photos are disposable now. Um, mm -hmm. It's just the nature, there's just so many of them. So. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you can use watermarks and stuff for putting stuff up online, but I always think it looks a bit weird. When you yeah, there's no, that. there's no point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the internet's too big for that. <laughs> <laughs> Are you gonna do your drawing? Yeah, I mean, it's getting quite late. I mean, I don't know if uh, if 
if you're wanting me to still doodle or if anyone wants to draw along or if you rather do it in your in your own time but you could do a quick 10 minutes yeah, yeah i could do a quick little uh yeah, yeah i could even a very brief one you can even just do one and, and put some some lyrics around the side. I'll move yeah. over to the other camera. Um, right, so um, these are the two I've got here. So what's here? This is the uh, the lyrics I was going to go with for my radio. This is um, Gaslight's anthem song called Fifty Nine Sound. So it talks about radio and it also talks about your favourite song. Um, and then I've got two. They go with the record. Um, there's I Met You Between the Wax and the Needle and the words of my favourite song. And then the other one was one I've done a line of cut already. I don't know if you can see these. Um, still, we sing with our heroes 33 rounds per minute. And then that's another radio one. Um, the line is, I don't drive nowhere without the radio on. But um, yeah, I was thinking if like, folk could, um, if they wanted to colour these in, or um, add their own lyrics, or draw along with me, or something. But what I normally do when I've got a record is I'll um, write the the words clockwise around the record. I don't know if you can see this. Oh, I've got a dog on, climbing on my back. <laughs> um, speaker view, you'll be able to, Pamela should come up on the big screen. So Pamela, when you do this, do you always do, when you're doing the song lyrics, do you, do you always add the words in afterwards or is it just depending what it is? Um, each, each one's a, a, a new lino that I do. Um, I'll draw it out first and then um, so I find this really weird because I normally draw backwards so I was actually writing the words the right way around. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll draw in the, the lyrics as part of the, the design um, and then carve it all afterwards. I probably should just have like a template and then I can just change the lyrics as we go. Um, right, what, what will I write on this one? Uh, so, did you? Pamela, yeah. when do you find that you listen to most music? Is it like uh, through headphones when oh. you're out or while you're you working? know? I, I actually spend um, a lot of time um, listening to the radio and um, listening to six music. Um, mainly, um, I like having music on all the time. We've got, um, well, David's got a record player in here, and then we've got a record player in the living room as well, and uh, in the car, you know, the radio in the kitchen when I'm making dinner, just just all the time. I, I hardly ever wear headphones, so I actually feel really weird just now with headphones on. <laughs> um, and because I can't see the screen because I'm at the other one. Yeah, I'm just drawing a little boom box here. Hun. Oh yeah, that's weird. It's like um, <laughs> Tony Hart or something. Or Art Attack, remember that? Oh man, yep. <laughs> what pen, is that a Posca pen that you yeah. use now? Yeah, yeah, so I've got Posca. Normally um, on my lino, I would draw, just do a kind of rough drawing in uh, pencil and then I go over it with a sharpie because um, sharpies are indelible so if you were to um, clean it it should kind of stay on um, it's more for if you're doing a, a multi um, a multi layer lino you would want to keep a wee bit of the design in the background so you could see where to cut but most of the time I just do black and white ones so um, but yeah, I had my Posca's out for that big mural, so I um, thought I would use it for this, and it's better to see the the lines as well. I actually brought on my, my blue pen, seeing as how my project is January Blues, but maybe I'll do some colouring in with that. Um, right, so I'll draw the wee aerial. So normally I'll, I'll draw the design, and then I'll decide where I'll put the lyrics afterwards. Um, sometimes I'll put them around the, uh, the side, or I'll incorporate them into the image 
that I use. Mm -hmm. But um, and like so, like these songs here, these them um, mention radios and record players. Um, but then other songs, like some songs, don't actually have a particular theme to it. There's not like imagery you can pick out. So it's good, like the the Bonnie Var one that I showed earlier. I just used um, headphones and I put the the song around the the wire because there's there's not all, always a a theme to go along with it. But um, oh, it's so weird. So weird, like not being able to see what's going on. David's just laughing at me. Can you see? <laughs> Why aren't you taking part, David? Um, right. So the the song um, I was going to write on here um, is the Fifty Nine Sound by the Gas Anthem, which was the record that was sitting looking at you the whole time um, that we were chatting. Um, but it's the the song of the what, what would you call it? The title track. Yes. And um, so the the lyrics I'm using is did you hear the 59 sound coming through on your grandmama's radio and then there's a couple of lines which i'm not doing because they're really depressing and then did you hear your favorite song one last time um i think i will actually use blue pen to mix it up a wee bit so you usually when i'm drawing out i would draw in pencil first and then go over it with pen but for quickness i'm just Using pens straight away. Mm. I really love those cal calligraphs. Is that what they were called? Yeah, yeah. The the well, I I don't actually really know if I'm doing the, the like saying the right word because the the way I would think of a calligraph is is like a um, not embossed, the opposite of embossed. So it's like a a three D plate. So you would maybe put like string and beads and sand and then you would ink that up and um, so but the, the way I did those ones was it was like a, a a bit of cardboard and I almost like like I used a scalpel to kind of take away the first layer of cardboard and then like varnished on top of it and um, so it's kind of a half calligraph half etching um, I, I was just making it up because I've seen courses at the DCA and always been like, oh yeah, I'll do that one day and then never got around to it. And because it was lockdown, I was like, you know what, I'll just try and do it myself. But um, I think the, the blue ink as well worked really yeah. nicely with them. But I, I'm planning on doing a few more of those um, for for this project. Um, but they're, they're quite time consuming as well because you need to wait for glue to dry and... Um, oh all the carving out and then the ink takes quite a long time to to dry as well once you've done it you need to soak the paper before you print them so it's like you, you rub the ink into all the wee grooves all the bits you've cut out and and then wipe away the excess and then because the paper's a bit wet it sucks out all the ink so the darker bits is where the ink's kind of stuck a bit more than than other bits but um yeah, it's, I'm not very. I'm not describing this very well, but <laughs> but yeah, um, I'm glad. I, I'm glad I tried it, and I probably wouldn't have done it without fun today. Um, <laughs> did you? But um, I always want to. I've got all these things. That I'm like, oh yeah, I'll try that eventually. Um, and even the that um, light sensitive paper, light sensitive paper that I got. Mm. Um, that was like a new thing, and I was like, "Oh, that'd be great for fun today." Yeah. See, when you're doing your designs for your line of cut printing, do you really? You must have to really have in mind how the line of like cut process works. You know, the what did you call it? The the taking away part. Yeah, yeah, because you have to kind of think backwards. Yeah. Um, I mean, because most of mine are just like one color, like black and white. Um, it's not as difficult as when you're doing loads of different colours. Um, but yeah, thinking back, so I, in the, the video of my line of cut that I showed, I had a wee mirror. So every now and again, I might look, especially with text, I'll look it in the mirror to make sure it is actually backwards yeah. um, on the line. -o. And then even just for getting perspective it's right and stuff, it's good to check it out in the mirror as well. Uh, um, but um, 
I've done so many of them now that um, I think it just comes a lot more naturally yeah. than when I first started doing um, lino cuts. But the ones I did when I was at art college, they were they were all colour ones. So they'd be like multiple, multiple layers and stuff. They're a lot more complicated. But um, I remember just being really stressed out about the process the whole time. So I'm glad I kind of st stick to the um, black and white ones. <laughs> oh, good. Right, how does my yeah? I drew I drew the radio because I most of the time when I listen to music it is on the the radio, hmm. but we've always got music on the go in the house. Yes, how's everyone getting on? Just much. Everyone's faces. Yeah. <laughs> <Lost> <laughs> What's it meant to be? Upstairs. Oh, I'm doing the Black Balloon song because I saw that earlier in your. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, the kills. Yeah, I should have had a few more examples because mm -mm. I've done, like, how many lyrics would I have done? Prince. Oh, yeah, 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 I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I've got over 100 things in my Etsy shop. Some of those are cards, so. Um, but I don't know, maybe about 60, 70 of them might be lyrics ones. And there's a few that I've sold out that um, that I haven't stocked back up. So I would have, I probably, I've done over 100. I probably would have put this whole first sentence under here and then the second one under here, but I've put the sound over here. But um, yeah, this is like, like when I'm doing a design, I'll, I'll do quite a few, just like quick thumbnail sketches just to get the, the idea of, of where everything will go. Mm -hmm. um, like try the text in a few different places and, and then once I've decided, I'll draw it out properly on the, on the lino. But um, I would have maybe put the text a bit bigger or in capitals maybe. But um, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I think we're just going to be finishing up anyway. Yeah, that's us. Just Bye. 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 I'm going to share mine just now. Yeah, me too, actually. No, oh, amazing. I love it. Oh, wow. You put it on gallery view then. Oh, I love it. <laughs> David hasn't done anything. <laughs> An iPod. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Oh, I like that. That's a really nice shape. Yeah, iPod. yeah. That's on my list. Oh, yeah. God, that's a good one. Yeah. Also, the, um, remember the CD portable round oh, ones you used to get, and it was just the C one CD that would spin around in it, and it was flat. Um, oh, what were they called? Well, CD, portable CD players, but it was just, I can't remember. Uh, yeah. yeah, that would be yeah. Kelly, have you done anything? I know you're not sh on video. I've not done mine, but it's printed off. It's in the chat. Nice. Oh. Oh, yeah, so it is. Oh, cool. oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, well, thank you so cool. much. Hello. Thank you, guys. Thank you. thank you for asking us. Oh, yeah, it's been a pleasure. Really insightful. Yeah, and, and the, the PDFs can be shared out. So if you know, yep. people want to, to do Oh, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Might help people out of this. My, my, my squint drawings. I don't think I know what a straight line is. So it's <laughs> if, if anyone's actually interested in how we did the PDFs, we use an app called Adobe Capture, which is a free app. Okay. And you take a photograph of a line drawn and it turns it into a vector, which means it can be scaled up to any size. Oh, right. Okay. Um, so you, I think you need it to... It kind of rounds everything a wee bit as well, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, so it's a, it's a really nice effect. So it's Adobe Capture is the name of the app. Adobe Capture. It's free, you just need to sign up with an email address. Um, well, thank you guys so much. We'll let you get away. Um, and yeah, we'll catch up with you on social media to follow your projects. Okay. All, all the best. Bye. 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 All the best, Kelly. Bye.